Well, I'm seeing your whole desktop at that. And how about just the main slide now? Yeah, that's probably a little better. Perfect. Um, all right, uh, sh should I begin? Um, yep. Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, thank you for taking the time um, to hear my thesis defense and uh, just after, you, know, you guys have given me a lot of support throughout uh, the semester and just redirecting me and sort of uh, when I've, I've been in a little bit of hurricane, you've, you've shown me some, some guidance that's been really helpful. Um, so uh, you have to talk up just a little, Sean, or get closer or increase your volume. Let's see. All right. Can you hear me a little better now? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Great. Thanks. Um, so, so I, for my thesis project, um, I created mock-ups for, in an, in an effort to basically demonstrate how uh, virtual simulation um, can be embedded with learning principles, um, specifically that of uh, James Paul G. And in an effort to show how it can create an effective learning environment for scuba diving. Um, and the, the research question that I'm, I'm trying to answer here is, is what features would be helpful um, in a game, simula in game simulation uh, to be an effective teaching tool and learning experience for, for people that would like to uh, learn how to scuba dive or also to sort of refresh uh, knowledge if they haven't been scuba diving uh, in some time. Um, so uh, just a little bit about um, the project itself and, and why I think that this is worthy of uh, research for a thesis. Um, I, I, I'm a diver myself and um, living, in, living in the Caribbean, um, so I, I, I try to tell people all the wonders of, of seeing and exploring uh, a new world um, and how it's exciting, but, but of course there's a lot of dangers associated with, with this activity. Um, so I, through my learning I, I, and my um, literature review, I sort of learned a little bit about the statistics of uh, what groups of people are more susceptible um, to accidents and incidents underwater and, and what what efforts are organizations and agencies trying to do in order to uh, sort of mitigate this risk and reduce any sort of dangerous incidents. Um, so I, I did sort of find that there are um, simulations that have already been created, um, but there really isn't something that is truly immersive. Um, and there are simulations that exist uh, to sort of simulate the underwater world, but they, they haven't embedded important diving principles and uh, knowledge that, that a diver must understand in order to be able to safely dive. Um, so, so I think that simulations are engaging. Uh, they're being used in a variety of applications from education to training uh, or entertainment. And uh, what's sort of exciting about it is, it, is it's risk-free. So. Uh, you can put yourself in a scenario where um, you're, you're totally safe, but what, what you're learning is, is an application that might potentially be dangerous to yourself. Um, so I found that virtual simulations can lead to better learning outcomes because they're more engaging and, and motivating. Um, so I had two, two research questions. My primary one was sort of the features um, that are needed in order for it, be, for it to be effective as a teaching tool for scuba divers. Um, and the second one really related to, um, you know, how is it, is it a more engaging learning experience uh, in comparison with a, a traditional learning environment, such as in a classroom um, or maybe something like an e-learning platform? Um, so those are my, my questions that I was researching. Um, so I, I reviewed, I sort of, when I first started doing my literature review, um, I, I felt like I couldn't find a, a very narrow focus or it was too broad. Um, and as I was doing my research, I kept finding more and more things that I, I felt I needed to include uh, to make you know, a better judgment on this topic. Um, 
So as I was researching, I kept finding more and more articles that were more specific, and I learned a lot more throughout the, the, the research process. Um, but some of the key findings that I found were um, that simulations and virtual reality and augmented reality have all been successfully implemented um, in applications of training and education. Um, I can go into some specific examples. Um, so games and simulation environments, uh, increase engagement, motivation, and support this idea of active learning. Um, and so and we've also got motivational factors. So a lot of people are using virtual reality in education um, because one of the factors stemmed from uh, trying to connect it to a constructive, constructivist uh, pedagogy. Uh, they want to increase collaboration and they also want to uh, provide some sort of gamification uh, elements into their, into their learning experiences. Um, so I did find that uh, a lot of different programs, um, for instance, like simulations that use VR for training environments, uh, there was, there's a company that creates, a, a, it's called Skyjack, that makes scissor lifts, scissor lifts for uh, doing repairs on things like, uh, you know, items that are typically difficult to reach. So they have all their tools to go in a scissor lift and uh, learning how to use this in, in potentially unsafe environments where there's things like high winds or maybe uh, in electrical lines that are dangerous. Um, they use training simulations and they actually totally recreate uh, the physical model of, of the machine that they're using and they're simulating this training environment and they're incorporating things like wind and, and this, uh, these other risks, but they're doing it in, in an environment that's, that's totally safe. Um, so there are companies that are doing this. Um, they're actually one of the earliest applications of simulated environments in virtual reality was uh, for pilot training for uh, flying a cockpit. So they can actually physically recreate total models of what that space would be like and you can interact with it. Um, so as far as motivational factors, um, and, and specifically the constructivist pedagogy, um, I found that really the, the reason for the motivation for this was that it, it sort of, um, it creates an environment where learners are more self-directed and it's more personalized learning. Um, and it's, there's, I found a really good study that uh, it, it did a, a systematic review on pretty much all applications for um, virtual reality in the education. And they found that, um, they found that, you know, students were, they, they wanted to find a way to stimulate deeper learning in students. Um, and they also found that VR enabled them to be able to sort of explore and become immersed. Um, and sort of develop their own meaning from their experiences that they were having. Um, so this was a key factor for why most people use this uh, virtual reality and simulations in education. Um, as far as gamification, which I mentioned, um, essentially all that is, is, is we're trying to find uh, game elements, things like rewards and badges and challenges um, in, in sort of a non-gaming context. Uh, so for instance, you know, even in a basic traditional classroom, how, how might you, you can have a point system um, instead of maybe giving a, a grade uh, or giving written feedback. These are all, you could also sort of uh, give them this goal um, in, in a class where they basically achieve badges before they become, you know, a gold level at whatever skill it is that they're trying to learn. So uh, trying to embed these things into a simulation can also work to increase engagement. And that was a, a key factor for why people use it in education. Um, so other key findings that I found, there was a really great article um, where what they actually did was they, they created, they identified um, the, the areas of scuba diving that are the most dangerous. Um, so some of those situations might be um, not checking your weight correctly. So a lot of incidents where people get harmed, uh, they, they, in order to account for buoyancy, uh, they have a vest that they actually fill with air, but you also use uh, weights in order to weigh you down so you don't rise to the top depending on your depth. Um, so this particular simulation that was created 
um, actually it was more like a video game platform and it wasn't necessarily immersive, but it still qualifies as a simulation. And it sort of tasks the player or uh, whoever's participating in it to make correct decisions. Uh, and what it did was it actually evaluated whether or not they made safe decisions. So uh, another important aspect of safety is making sure that you have your dive partner or your buddy very close to you at all times. Um, so if in the game or the simulation, you sort of swam away too far from your buddy and didn't check in with that, your buddy, then it would sort of trigger uh, some sort of problem. Um, so what the simulation effectively did was uh, it provided a, a good technical quality um, and usability. And uh, what they were able to do is actually identify these areas where scuba divers who are not diving very frequently were forgetting important skills and procedures uh, related to safety. And essentially with those findings, uh, they would then make better informed decisions about how you could recreate a training experience, um, whatever that might be, if it was in a classroom or in a re refresher diving course, where if you haven't been diving for a long time, you can, you can incorporate these findings. Um, so it has been used and uh, it took me a long time to find an example where there was some sort of simulation specific to scuba diving that uh, had a goal of, of trying to uh, teach or reteach procedures that are important to, to know and understand. Um, so for my method, um, I, I chose to go with um, these learning principles uh, identified by James Paul G and that he finds are common in really good games. And essentially what he's done is he's looked at, he's evaluated games and he's identified these, these good learning principles. And he said, well, this can also be applied to any learning context. Um, so I, I sort of used his learning principles to analyze uh, a, a, a simulation game. It's sort of in a simulation experience game called Infinite Scuba. Um, so I, I have a description of uh, the, the simulation from the actual website. And so it's, it's made by Cascade Game Foundry. And so they describe this uh, game as an environment where players do what real divers do, identify wildlife, find artifacts, collect branded scuba gear, take photos to share with friends. Um, and they also get to learn about dive science, local culture, by looking at uh, specific dive sites in the world that have been re reconstructed into these uh, simulation environments, history, and environmental issues. Um, so I found that you know while you're a diver and you can explore, um, it's really great sort of learning about what, what it's like underwater and what the topography looks like and what can you can expect, but it doesn't necessarily prepare uh, a diver you know, with a technical know-how and skills uh, in order to be able to dive um, safely. So it actually tells you when he, when he wants the simulation, it says, do not attempt to scuba uh, without proper equipment, training, and certification from an accredited organization. Um, so using James, James Paul G's learning principles, I thought I could use uh, this simulation, which is really realistic of uh, the underwater world, and see how uh, can we sort of embed um, learning principles in order to better prepare a diver uh, with uh, certain skills that they would need. Um, so this is sort of an overview. He, he breaks down, he's revised these principles several times. Um, and I've, I found this is one of the, the best layouts for how he organized these. And um, so he sort of breaks it down into these three categories, empowered learners, um, problem solving and deep understanding. And these are important areas that, um, uh, and there's, you can see the different makeups of each category. Uh, and these are all principles that he, he identifies as good for learning that can uh, be connected with games. So I'll, I'll show you in my mock-up how uh, I have basically created these prototype mock-ups in the form of graphics, uh, and how I think we can take some of the important scuba procedures and uh, knowledge and apply it to uh, the graphics that I've made uh, for scuba diving. Um, so 
the the analysis is is essentially it has um, sorry I think I, I mentioned this already so I'll have uh, screenshots of the simulation uh, in my actual thesis and I try to and when I analyze uh, infinite scuba the simulation I, I essentially look at every single one of these principles and I try and identify whether or not it's uh, successfully um, you know, sort of embedding these scuba elements that you would need in order to know how to dive um, safely. So, um, moving on, this is this is the uh, prototype itself. So early on, I I really I I was kind of gung ho about creating some sort of immersive uh, virtual environment, and quickly realized that I was limited on resources. Um, and so I was sort of uh, constrained to creating um, mock-ups using graphics software that was, you know, in a still image. Um, but what I thought I was able to do is incorporate some of these important scuba concepts in using visualizations from uh, Infinite Scuba that I had used for my analysis. Um, so these mock-ups that I'll show you in a moment, um, I think that they demonstrate how uh, a virtual simulation can be embedded with these concepts. They're important to, to understand in scuba diving and can create for uh, an effective training tool. Um, so uh, I sort of broke it down into three scenarios that uh, are important for scuba. Uh, first is underwater communication. Um, so how do you, how if you can't, sound doesn't travel through water, um, you can't speak and your dive partner cannot hear you. They can hear certain tones, like if you were to clank a piece of steel against your dive tank. Um, but a lot of things are communicated using hand signals, um, or they also make these uh, tablets where you can take, uh, you can essentially write messages underwater. Um, but it's important to communicate things like how much air you have, uh, things to avoid, uh, such as that. Uh, the second component we're going to look at is planning a dive, and that has to do with sort of the dive science behind uh, how deep you go, how long you have to do a surface interval after you do your first dive before you can go underwater safely again. Um, and then lastly is underwater navigation. So there's a, there's a number of factors that affect, um, you're very disoriented underwater. Um, it's difficult because a lot of the terrain looks very similar and you don't have uh, typically very, very um, identifiable landmarks. So uh, using different tools in order to navigate effectively. Uh, so I made these, these um, mock-ups using Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop. Uh, and I sort of sourced different screenshots from Infinite Scuba. Um, Excuse me, Sean, I just wanted to give you the uh, nine minute warning. <laughs> Um, so here's the first one, and this focuses on underwater communication. Um, so in this example, players closely communicate with their dive partner um, by accessing common signals on demand. Um, so we you see in bold here, these are different principles that uh, James Paul G. identifies as important in learning. And I can describe uh, what each one of those are as we look at the mock-up. Um, so in, in on demand, uh, essentially this is an environment that James Paul G identifies as good for learning where learners basically get their information, uh, when, when they want it. Um, so for instance, if I don't know what a dive signal is, uh, so in this case, my buddy is the, the guy on the center of the screen and he's actually showing me a signal, um, that says how much air do you have? So. Um, if you look up here, you know, you can access, um, in this simulation, you can access a guide that will show you the meaning of different hand signals. And then, so this would be an on-demand tool where you can access this information uh, right away when you need it. So looking over here, uh, this is your own, as you're diving, your own uh, depth gauge and your air on the bottom. So. Uh, the diver would have to then communicate in this situation the, the correct response. Um, so they're totally out of air, which is, is uh, pretty dangerous, and they would have to basically show the correct signal um, that they are out of air. So in this case, um, 
you know, they would, they would either say zero or they would uh, signal for no error. Um, so they would choose the appropriate, and this would essentially serve as an assessment. So I sort of imagine that like the other simulation I showed you, you could collect this data and this could be used as a, maybe for a few future studies, something that could actually collect all this information about the wrong and correct decisions. And, uh, you know, this is done in a safe environment where uh, underwater you could, you could be in a very dangerous situation. Um, so another principle that was applied to this specific scenario is um, uh, Guy's principle of just in time. And so, for instance, the example that he uses is uh, if you were going to go to Italy, um, you know, you wouldn't read the whole travel guide uh, or you wouldn't read a whole encyclopedia and learn all about Italy, but you might open up a tour guide when you're actually at a spot. Uh, a landmark where you wanted to learn about the Sistine Chapel. Um, so getting that information just in time where we're in the context where it can be applied and relevant is, is much easier for learners as a good learning principle. So in this case, uh, they probably, you know, they're not going to read. It'd be nice to know every single dive signal and how to communicate. Uh, I've been diving for years and I, I don't know all of them. Um, but if you were playing a simulation like this, you wouldn't have to front load all of this content. Um, it's important to, to develop a strong mastery understanding of certain ones. Um, but in this case, I can quickly reference this information just in time uh, before I'm sort of assessed with what to do. So I have it and I can access it and it's at a, a time appropriate uh, moment. Um, so here's, here's another, this is the second scenario and this has to do with planning a dive. Um, so, so players have to, or divers have to develop an expertise in, in utilizing uh, what's called an RDP or a recreational dive planner. And this is really important in order to uh, sort of understand when it's safe to dive again. So as you, as you dive, you go deeper, um, you're breathing in, um, you know, uh, out, of a, out of a tank that's on your back. And what happens the deeper you go underwater is it actually there's there's nitrogen that's sort of absorbed by your body. And it's really important to know how deep you go and how long your dive is because that nitrogen has to sort of uh, escape your, your blood and you, you do certain procedures in order to make sure that that's done carefully. If you don't do this carefully, if you dive immediately or that, uh, those air bubbles do not have a chance to escape. You can be in a dangerous situation that can lead to um, paralysis um, or even death. Um, so that's the, there's a sickness called decompression sickness, and, and it also happens to pilots at high altitudes um, or extreme death, deaths. So it's important um, in this case that a diver could basically figure out how to uh, determine what pressure group they're in, which is again determined by how deep they go, and how long they're there. And if they're planning another dive, how long must they wait before they can safely go in the water again? Sean, um, where, this, where, this I'm, pretty, I hate to interrupt this you. Is a pretty challenging concept. Sean, can you hear uh, me? And there are, there are Sean, scenarios in diving, us? like uh, typically what you have is a dive computer or you have a dive instructor that is there that's planning these for you but it's always your responsibility to make sure that you, you sort of understand because you're the one taking the risk. Um, so while a lot of people these days use dive computers, uh, a dive table is the most traditional way to do this, and every diver must learn how the, sort of the, the science behind it or the technique in order to calculate, um, in order to plan a safe dive. Sean, Sean can you hear me? Days. Can you hear us? Uh, basically developing the Sean, skill, can you hear us? Uh, he talks about skills as strategies. So I sort of identified using this chart and calculating your surface interval before your second dive as a strategy to safely plan a dive. Um, and one of the um, other principles that he talks about um, in, um, let's see, it's called um, cycles of expertise in problem solving. Um, so in this example, this is, is fairly complex. And it can become even more complex if uh, you're diving in different circumstances. So if I'm diving at an altitude, 
there's a totally different recreational dive planner uh, that you use to calculate your surface interval. If you're diving with uh, mixed gases, such as enriched uh, nitrogen, well, there's a totally different set. So according to the, the cycle of expertise, you're sort of mastering a specific skill and then uh, a subsequent challenge is introduced that's just out of you know, sort of that, that regime of confidence. And then you're again mastering that skill and pra practicing until you master it. And then sort of another uh, extension of that. So it's, it's a, it's a ongoing cycle and sort of, he says that this is how we uh, create experts in any field. John, do you hear us? Um, I'm not sure what happened there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had to Let's break see. in on you, Sean, because um, okay. we're lo we're Should running. I, you guys? I don't think you can hear us. Can yeah. you hear us, Sean? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I I'm in my classroom, and uh, I have this system set up. Unfortunately, can you hear me? Right? Can yeah, you can hear really you. quick? Okay. All right. I I didn't hear you that whole time. I am so sorry. <laughs> Uh, you've probably been asking questions. <laughs> um, sorry, did I miss anything? I apologize. If you if you asked something, I didn't well, hear you. We're pretty much out of time. Um, I wanted to be able to give you some feedback. Um, okay, I apologize. Uh, sure. I'm sure Russ also. Um, uh, really quickly, um, so you, I, I am really appreciative that you um, incorporated Guy in there. Um, mm -hmm. One thing about Guy that I think you, uh, or Guy, some of Guy's principles that you did not include is the idea of the identity of the virtual identity of the player and how you want, uh, eventually your goal is to make the, the, pl the player feel um, to adopt the identity of a scuba diver. And, um, but you can do that in your paper. Um, otherwise, really great presentation. Russ, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I uh, I really, I thought that went well. I um, didn't have any major concerns. Um, is, is there, you know, what would be the motivation as they're going through this? Uh, is there any sort of scoring system or, I don't know, some sort of feedback where they, you know, they have to get a certain point total to, to get their whatever... Uh, you know, whatever they get for for reaching a, a level on scuba diving, or is there any other, or is it just sort of the knowing that you're learning? I think um, you would have to, if, uh, event, the goal is uh, obviously the cer certification, correct? Right. Yes. So um, I think a, a feedback system of just knowing whether you're wrong or right to help you get to the point so you, so you can get your certification um, is the goal. Um, I don't know if this could replace a live instructor for certification at any time in the near future. Um, I think that's kind of far out for the technology. Would you agree? Uh, uh, like, yeah. What does the certification actually require, Sean? So if you wanted to, there's many different levels of cert certification. I was looking at uh, the first entry level, uh, which is it's open water scuba diver, which is recreational. And it, it, it's comprised of three parts. One, where you learn the theory, and that's sort of how you learn about how it affects your body. Um, you learn an overview of equipment. Um, but all of that is actually done either on an e-learning course, where essentially you're just reading through a, a digital packet of information, and then you have an assessment at the end. Um, or that can also be done in a classroom where you have an instructor and they're actually, you know, face to face. Uh, there's also, there's, there's two other parts in order to get certified. One is uh, a confined water dive in which you basically are learning about the equipment and learning some basic safety procedures in a, in a pool or similar environment. And then the, the third and final part is where you're actually demonstrating your expert expertise of these different skills in an open water environment, such as the ocean or a sea or a lake or something like that. So I think that it would be it would be challenging to obviously do those more practical hands-on portions, but I I do feel like it might uh, I see it as a supplementary tool, but I also think that it can be uh, you know joined in with that sort of uh, practical theoretical portion 
where you're in a classroom or you're, you're uh, in an e-learning platform, but you're actually doing the assessment through a simulation such as this. Okay, thanks, uh, Sean. Um, yeah, I just think about some sort of feedback. I just wanted to thank Sean. Um, you know, we often talk to students about what the projects are about, and you offered a really memorable um, project. And I think you're our only student who's focused on scuba diving. So, uh, so that was really original and interesting and adds to, you know, our last simulation that I can remember was uh, car mechanic um, problem solving. So now we have some new things to talk to potential students about. So I think you did a really nice job, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, um, Jill, um, whenever you're ready, there should be, uh, if you've got something on your screen to share, you should be able to go to screen share.